tonight, it is all on the line for TikTok, gearing up for a TBD vote in the Senate that would force a sale or else a ban. What we're hearing tonight from Congress and the TikTok team about a move that could affect more than 150 million users. Then in Haiti, U.S. boots on the ground as a country in crisis crumbles into chaos. More on the Marines in Port-au-Prince with our reporter landing just across the border tonight. He's going to join us in just a minute. Plus, in tonight's original and NBC News investigation, autism treatment services run by big private equity firms. Why one mom tells me she thinks they put profits over patients and what the company's saying tonight. And the talk show on X that never will be. Why a former CNN anchor's partnership with Elon Musk fell apart before a single episode ever rolled out. That's a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight we start with TikTok, yes? It is on the clock with its future in the hands of the Senate. After that House vote in just the last couple hours on a bill to ban the app, unless its Chinese-based owner sells off TikTok in the next six months. How do you think the company feels about it? Not happy, and they're not being shy, saying the bill was jammed through. TikTok's CEO on the Hill today, presumably to try to keep the app alive. As this company points out, TikTok's not just good for people who love trends and tutorials. It's good for the economy, too. Here's the thing, even some supporters of this bill say they don't want to see the end of TikTok altogether. They just hope to strong arm the app out of, as they see it, Beijing's control. Because remember, that's what this is all about. Lawmakers arguing TikTok is a national security threat. Our intention is for TikTok to continue to operate, but not under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. I have no problem uh, with continued dance videos or even political campaigning on TikTok so long as the ownership structure changes. Remember, the concern isn't just that TikTok, like a lot of apps, can access your data, like your IP address, your synced contacts, etc. It's the concern that China could manipulate the platform to spread mis- or disinformation. With the director of national intelligence telling lawmakers just recently she can't rule out whether China could use TikTok to influence the upcoming election. One of the biggest questions right now, then, what will the Senate do? That is a major TBD. Our Hill team reports that chamber probably won't move as fast. You see the question marks there. However, the White House says the president would sign the bill if it lands on his desk, despite, of course, his campaign having a TikTok of its own. We've got team coverage, Brian Chung following the business angle, but let's start with Saho Kapoor on Capitol Hill. Okay, the bill is through. The bill is passed. We've heard the concerns from lawmakers. It is passed the House. It's still got to get through the Senate, where it seems to be a bit of a tougher road ahead. Talk us through it. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. It was an extraordinary bipartisan vote to pass this bill. 352 votes, Nancy Pelosi to the Freedom Caucus, to every uh, sor sort of ideology in between. It'll certainly put some pressure on the Senate to move here. The opposition including included 50 Democrats, 15 Republicans. Uh, many of those 50 Democrats are progressives who tend to have a closer connection to young voters, not coincidentally. But of course, it's in the hands of the Senate. Take a listen to what uh, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries said uh, about what comes next. Uh, I know a lot of who am I to tell the Senate what to do in terms of its own agenda? Uh, you know, there's a process. They pass bills, send it over to us for consideration. We pass bills, send it over to them. Uh, the ball is now in the court of the senators, and I trust uh, Leader Chuck Schumer. Now, what did Chuck Schumer say about this? He put out a strikingly insipid statement, and let's show it, saying, quote, the Senate will review the legislation when it comes over from the House. That was it. That was the end of his statement. No commitment to a vote uh, on this bill or uh, a similar bill like it. The Senate, of course, is a notoriously sluggish body, but many senators do feel the need to act on this, including notably the chair and vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Mark Warner and Marco Rubio. They put out a joint statement saying, quote, we were encouraged by today's strong bipartisan vote in the House of representatives, and they said they look forward to working together to get this bill passed. There are other senators who say they want to amend the bill and do a broader bill on foreign controlled uh, apps, not necessarily social media, but broader companies. Yet others want to do a bigger tech policy and privacy bill. So there are a lot of ways this could go. And the Senate right now, Hallie, does not feel quite the same level of urgency to move on this quickly. This is all, as we talked about, about national security concerns. And there's a lot of apps that collect data from users. The big deal here, the concern from lawmakers, is what the Chinese government could do with this. TikTok denies that the Chinese government has any control over the app. They've long insisted that they work to protect user data, saying that new U.S. user data actually is routed through U.S.-based cloud servers here. But the backdrop of this is undeniable. It's a critical election year, and the specter of misinformation related to that election or disinformation related to that election looms large. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right, Hallie. Firstly, this is not an outright ban bill. This is a divest or get banned bill. TikTok's parent company is ByteDance. This is the heart of the matter. It is headquartered in Beijing, which, according to Chinese law, makes it subject to the Chinese government's demands if they want its information, maybe get access to its algorithms. Let's take a look at the uh, information that uh, TikTok collects. They go pretty deep into uh, the users in terms of uh, names, ages. They get phone numbers and emails, locations, face, voice, and, uh, of course, the algorithms have a huge impact on what types of content shows up in the feeds of the roughly 170 million Americans who are on this, some of course more often than others. The U.S. considers China a malign actor, hence it's worried that uh, it could abuse this information. TikTok and its CEO, Sho Chu, have insisted that nobody needs to worry about this, that China won't get access. Uh, the House voted overwhelmingly to tell them that's nice, but we don't trust you. Divest or get banned. That's where they are right now. Uh, recent security briefings uh, in Congress have really moved members in the direction of wanting to act to prohibit or at least curtail uh, TikTok as it exists today. Senator Richard Blumenthal, a uh, Democrat I spoke to recently, said the more he learns about TikTok, the more frightening it becomes. Ali. Sahil Kapoor, live for us there uh, on the Hill. Busy day for you and for so many today. Brian Chung, let me go to you for more on the business side of this because TikTok's response has been pretty aggressive. They've launched this campaign to try to essentially push back on some of the allegations being made. Yeah, and the statement that they released in the minutes after the House uh, voted to pass that legislation really underscores how they're leaning on their user base to push back. So uh, they did describe the process as, quote, secret, and the bill was jammed through for one reason. It's a ban. And as Sahil kind of uh, outlined that even though it's a divestiture bill, uh, conversations I've had with TikTok make it sound like they're not optimistic they could sell in six months. So they see this as an effective ban, which would impact the, as they cite here, 7 million small businesses, 170 million Americans that use their service. Service. And that's underscored by the fact that in the lead up to the committee vote uh, just last week, we did see uh, TikTok put notifications on the application asking and urging its users to ring up their representatives to say, vote no on this bill. And you're still seeing these notifications go out uh, after this was passed, even on the House side, obviously trying to set up the stage for whenever the Senate moves on their end. So uh, TikTok is going full court press here, trying to use their strong user base, which in many cases are young Gen Z voters that could be very pivotal in the election uh, to really drive uh, their case for staying in business. So again, we'll have to see how that pans out. But you are seeing the flooded uh, calls in Congress as an example of what TikTok is trying to do here, Hallie. But so if ByteDance were to spin off TikTok, Brian, if they were to sell, who, who would be a buyer realistically? Yeah, and here's the thing is that, again, in the conversations I've had, TikTok has made it sound like they don't feel optimistic about being able to sell in that six-month time frame. But broadly speaking, it sounds like there would be suitors out there. And one example of this is because of the fact that we have to remember, in 2020, then-President Trump tried to use an executive order to do the exact same thing here, which would be forcing the Chinese parent company ByteDance to sell TikTok. What happened in that case? We heard from the likes of Oracle and also Walmart as expressing interest in making a deal happen. So there is precedent for this, but those two potential uh, mergers never ended up happening. There was a little bit of political football and also legal hold, uh, kind of holdups that led to that ultimately not happening. But there could be another buyer here. What would the price tag be? What would the implications of that be? What would the access even be to using their algorithm? Would it be the same? Would it be something considerably stripped down? Those are all remaining questions that yeah. we might face if this bill does get passed by both the Senate and the White House. Well, the clock's ticking, Brian, right? Right, six months till a possible divestment or until the Senate does something, the president does something once he does sign that into law. If that happens, Brian Chung, thank you. We're looking ahead to tomorrow now and former President Trump will make an in-person appearance at a hearing in his federal classified documents case as Mr. Trump is coming off a legal win earlier today in Georgia. A judge dropping some, not all, but a few of the charges against him in the state's election interference case he faces. Tossing out three counts having to do with pressure he allegedly put on state officials to interfere in the 2020 election. The judge explaining his ruling, basically saying that the DA didn't give enough detail on the allegations, which meant the defendants, including Mr. Trump, didn't have the information they needed to defend themselves at trial. Here's the deal. None of this means that former President Trump is out of the woods from a legal perspective just yet. He still faces 10 counts in the Georgia case, 88 total felony counts across his four criminal indictments. NBC's Blaine Alexander is following all of this. Explain why the judge decided to kill some of these charges, Blaine, and what comes next. 
Well, basically, essentially saying that the DA's office didn't go far enough or didn't do enough to prove that there was a crime committed. I want to read to you a section from the judge's uh, nine-page ruling today that I think sums it up pretty well. You know, he writes, Judge Scott McAfee writes, the court's concern is less that the state has failed to allege sufficient conduct of the defendants. In fact, it is alleged in abundance. However, the lack of detail concerning an essential legal element is, in the undersigned's opinion, fatal. So what you're seeing here, there you see it on your screen right there. What you're seeing here is the judge basically saying, in this indictment, you didn't go far enough to prove it, but he's not slamming the door on it. You know, Vadi Willis has two options. She can either appeal this decision or she can aim for a re-indictment, take it back before a, a grand jury, kind of fix some of the issues and see if she can bring charges that way. There's also, and just for people thinking, well, wait a second, weren't we waiting for a ruling in Georgia coming imminently? This is not that ruling. The one that we've been waiting for had to do with the Fulton County District Attorney, Fonnie Willis, and whether she could be disqualified from this case. The expectation is still that should come down really any day. Any day, any second, Hallie. Okay. So that's the, when we started this week, we were expecting a, a major decision from the judge. And then this happened and nobody was expecting this. And not those of us who cover it. And of the people that I've been speaking with who are involved in this case, defense attorneys and others, they weren't expecting it either. This was largely unexpected by, by many people close to this case. But yes, we are still waiting to hear whether or not Judge, judge Scott McAfee is going to allow Fonnie Willis to stay on this case. He has said that he plans to have that ruling by Friday. We know he's on track to do that. And so that's certainly something that we're going to be watching for. But taken in its totality, Hallie, when you look at the past two and a half months or so of this case here in Georgia, we've been talking about everything almost other than the actual charges and evidence against the former president and his co-defendant. So we've already seen it very much be detoured. So whatever the judge decides is going to be certainly monumental in how this case is yeah. going to be moving forward, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, uh, live for us there in Giorgio, I'm sure we'll be talking again potentially later this week. Blaine, thanks. To Michigan now, because right as we were coming on the air, a jury there wrapped up its first few hours of deliberations in the trial to decide whether the father of a mass school shooter should be convicted for what a son did. The jury's going to be back tomorrow morning, which means we are really officially going to be on verdict watch then, with the prosecution and defense delivering closing arguments, trying to make their case. Listen. You hear him say that there was some doodling on a paper, that he, it was, he was a perfect kid. But here's what he never says. He never says, I don't know how he got it. Never says that. James Crumbly had no idea what his son was capable of. He had no idea what his son was planning. And he had absolutely no idea that his son had access to those firearms. So that is James Crumbly you're seeing walking into court today. The man who prosecutors say could have prevented the deaths of these four students, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Schilling at Oxford High School back in 2021. Crumbly is facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter, the same charges that his wife, Jennifer, was convicted on in her trial just last month. Adrian Broadus is joining us now from Pontiac, Michigan. One big thing in the closing arguments for the defense was that it wasn't just, they say, James Crumbly who didn't know his son was capable of this. It was a bunch of other people who knew his son also, right? Explain how that ties in. Hallie, that was a big piece of the defense's strategy, basically pointing to trained school leaders at Oxford High School, two of whom which testified. She was specifically uh, indicating the school counselor, Sean Hopkins, as well as the former dean of students, saying if these two school leaders didn't perceive Ethan Crumbly as a threat, how would his father perceive him as a threat? Here's more of what the defense attorney said during her closing arguments today. None of them told you that James knew what his son was planning. None of them told you that James knew that his son knew where those firearms were hidden. None of them told you that James knew that his son had somehow obtained access to the firearms that he had been hiding. And those school leaders also testified called to testify on behalf of the prosecution when we heard from hot Hopkins, he said his main concern was that Ethan Crumbly, who is now serving a life sentence without parole, was going to harm himself. 
He didn't see him as a danger to others, and he allowed him to go back to the classroom because he did not want him to be alone. And that is what the defense played up, not only in their closing argument today, but also on cross-examination. Also talking a great deal about that math worksheet where Ethan Crumbly drew images of what we now know to be the Oxford shooting that happened in 2021, Hallie. Adrian, we talked about how Jennifer Crumbly, the mother here, uh, the wife uh, here, was also convicted. The jury took about 11 hours to deliberate. Is there anything from her trial that could provide a blueprint here for what we think could happen in this instance? A lot of similarities in both cases after watching them, but some key differences. For example, the jury has already gone home for the day. They will return tomorrow morning. They did have the opportunity to deliberate late in the night. The prosecution, they will replay, and they took a lot of notes during the course of this trial, but the prosecution called 15 witnesses. The defense called one, which was the sister of James Crumley, Karen. Now, this trial has moved much quicker, at a quicker pace, when we compare to that of Jennifer Crumbly. Her trial lasted about two weeks. This trial so far, jury selection started last Tuesday. It's Wednesday, so it's been a week, and the jury already has the case. So it's up to these jurors to determine how fast they will move from here on out. Totally different jury. So we can't yeah. definitively, definitively say that we know when they'll come back with a verdict. Right, no, of course. Adrian brought us, thank you for being there. I know when they do, you will be uh, first to report it. Appreciate it. Secretary of State Tony Blinken, in just the last couple of hours, laying out three big things Haiti needs right now. A more stable government, humanitarian help, and security to be able to help the people who are still in Haiti as we speak. Listen. This has been uh, a long unfolding story. The heart of the story is the suffering of the Haitian people. And we want to see that brought to an end. Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, is now in a state of emergency. You've seen images like these now for days. Gangs banding together, attacking government institutions, attacking the airport, prisons too. According to the World Food Program, now four million people in Haiti face what they call acute food insecurity. A million are just a step away from famine. Gabe Gutierrez, our NBC News correspondent, has landed just across the border in the neighboring country of the Dominican Republic. He's got more for us tonight. Hey there, Hallie. We're here in the Dominican Republic where the government is already stopping desperate Haitians from coming to this country. And in Florida today, the governor announced that he's already deploying extra law enforcement and drones in anticipation of a possible migrant influx from Haiti. There are, are growing concerns that this humanitarian crisis will spill across the hemisphere. And just today, a new team of U.S. Marines went into Haiti to help beef up security at the American embassy there. The situation there is deteriorating quickly. As we've been reporting, the uh, gang leader barbecue is calling for a civil war. And the prime minister just announced uh, yesterday that he would resign as soon as a transitional government was put in place. But there are a lot of questions on when exactly that will happen. And Hallie, again, the desperate situation for uh, people inside Haiti. We just spoke today with Mitch Album. You, you know him as the best-selling author. He was actually in Haiti at the orphanage that his charity runs. And he described a dramatic escape. A private helicopter came and saved him and 10 other staffers in the dead of night. They piled into this helicopter, and he described the experience of going across the border. He had been desperate for days after that mass prison break really escalated the violence in the country, and the airports and the borders have all been shut down. Now, there have been an increasing number of Haitians that are trying to get over the border into the Dominican Republic. Again, this government is not letting them, but Hallie, this is an ongoing situation, and there's so many questions about the future of whether the U.S. will have to get more involved. Right now, the U.S. is saying that it is helping along a multinational security force led by Kenya to try and restore order in Haiti. Hallie? So listen, we know it has felt official for a while, but now it is officially presumptively official, a round two matchup between Joe Biden and Donald Trump come November. After both of these candidates passed that magic number they needed, the delegate math, mathing for them to clinch their party's nominations, 
means it's the longest general election in generations. But they're not your only options necessarily for president this fall. You could go third party. And one candidate who you might have heard from hopes that you will. Vaughn Hilliard explains. You might remember this ad from last month's Super Bowl. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. A jingle that worked six decades ago, reworked for a new era of Kennedys. Kennedy, Kennedy. This one, not as a Democrat like his uncle, but an independent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the son of the New York senator and former attorney general, now seeking his own path to the White House. But what does he believe in? Can he actually win? Neither my uncle nor my father would recognize the version of America that we have today. RFK Jr. first made his name as a climate activist and lawyer in the 80s, before pivoting this century to pushing debunked lies that vaccines cause autism. To be crystal clear, this is not true. Scientists have proven that over and over again. But it hasn't stopped the 70-year-old Kennedy, especially since the COVID pandemic, repeatedly spreading misinformation, like his book, baselessly attacking Dr. Anthony Fauci. I pressed him on COVID and vaccines at a rally in Las Vegas last month. Would you have tried to stop the FDA from approving the, the COVID vaccine? I would have said that they need to do science to show that the vaccine is actually going to avert more problems than it's, uh, that, than it's causing. But it's if you're president, you have agency uh, I would over make that sure that there was good science and that any product, but I also would have allowed people to get access to therapeutics that were actually demonstrated to work, like ivermectin, like hydroxychloroquine. Again, doctors say ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine should not be used to treat COVID. But Kennedy could take advantage of the growing number of Americans who don't seek out vaccines to stop COVID. Just 28% of adults have gotten the latest vaccine, down from 69% when it came out in 2021, according to a new Pew poll. The question is, is there an appetite for him or any third party candidate? A new poll out today shows yes, with RFK pulling in nearly 9% of the vote, more than 20% going to someone who isn't Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But can people see him on the ballot? Right now, not many will. The campaign says it has enough signatures in just four states as they try to get on the ballot in all 50. That hasn't stopped Kennedy from preparing like he will be with a vice presidential announcement set in just two weeks. Names he's floated, New York Jets quarterback and fellow anti-vaxxer Aaron Rodgers. Vaughn is joining us now. So as we're on the topic of veep stakes, Vaughn, right. because that really is the next key political moment for both former President Trump and for, I guess, RFK Jr., you're getting some new little nuggets, we can call them, on that. What is the deal? Really, Aaron Rodgers? I thought he was going to be playing for the Jets come the fall. <laughs> he says he's going to play for the Jets come opening week in September. And, of course, we'll see at training camp what kind of shape he's in after missing most of last season. But, look, he's 40 years old. And, you know, there's maybe a presidential candidate offering him the number two slot. And the Kennedy campaign told us just 24 hours ago that the top two names on his list were not only Aaron Rodgers, the the current New York Jets quarterback, but also Jesse Ventura, the former Minnesota governor and, of course, WWE wrestler. But just here in the last hour, the son of Jesse Ventura wrote back to me, quote, Governor Ventura will not comment on this particular political speculation. He has not been officially asked to join Mr. Kennedy's campaign as his vice presidential nominee, making all of this pure speculation. But just this afternoon, the Kennedy campaign, Halley, announced that they will be holding a VP announcement rally on on March 26th in Oakland, California, which is just 20 minutes from where Aaron Rodgers played his college ball at Cal Berkeley. Allie. Yeah, all right. We'll see. Fun Hilliard, um, thank you very much. I know where you'll be in a couple of weeks. Really appreciate you Thanks, reporting friend. on that tonight. Thanks. So listen, some other news breaking into us in just the last half an hour or so with a federal judge saying Hunter Biden is expected to go on trial potentially just a few months from now with a tentative trial date set for early June Keep in mind, right in the middle of his father's re-election campaign. Remember, it was back in September that a special counsel appointed by the attorney general charged Hunter Biden with three felony counts, all related to Hunter Biden's allegedly lying about his drug use when he bought a gun. NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos is joining us now. So the trial date is set. It sounds like it's going to go maybe a week to two. They laid out a few days for, the, obviously, the defense, for the prosecution, for the jury deliberations, et cetera. It's just a couple of months before the Democratic convention here. Talk about what this means legally for Hunter Biden, how you see it. 
Yeah, I'd be surprised if this federal trial goes two weeks. I mean, the charges are really based on the FFL, the Form 4473. They don't need to introduce a ton of documents, not a ton of witnesses or, or evidence. So you could see this case, and maybe jury selection could even last longer than the actual uh, government's case in chief. But these charges, by the way, are of questionable constitutional constitutionality now in the wake of uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin and then another decision coming out of the Fifth Circuit. It's easy to prove if someone is charged with being a felon in possession. That's not what Hunter's charged with. It's a lot harder to prove whether or not they were un an unlawful user or addict of a controlled substance uh, while owning a firearm. So these are charges that are not commonly brought for that reason. They're of questionable constitutionality. And uh, But you are in federal court, so the case will go to trial quickly. Danny Savalas, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, a brand new study saying there could be a new way to detect colon cancer. Why researchers say a blood test might be most accurate. Plus, what Olivia Rodrigo is handing out to fans at her concert in Missouri, it may surprise you. It's not a friendship bracelet. Shares of Dollar Tree tanking today, dropping nearly 15% after the company says it'll close nearly 1,000 stores. These are the places that, as the name implies, offers a lot of stuff at low prices. But the company blames things like high inflation, stores not selling enough, and a decrease in SNAP benefits that provide lower income families with money for food. CNBC retail reporter Gabby Alfon Rouge is with us. So you think these stores might be doing better in times like these, since people may be turning to discount stores for some of the, the items that they need. Explain this. I mean, that's exactly right, Hallie. When times are tough, discount retailers like Dollar Tree tend to do really, really well. But you have to keep in mind that their target consumer is the low income consumer. And now they're two years into persistent inflation, high interest rates, dwindling savings account. So those consumers are under a tremendous amount of pressure, and that's putting a lot of pressure on Dollar Tree's business. You got to keep in mind, Dollar Tree makes their money by selling the things that people don't actually need, discretionary items, things like toys and decorations, all the things that are nice to have. So at the family dollar stores where they're planning on closing about um, you know, a thousand over the next couple of years, they, those consumers are not buying those discretionary items. They're buying food, which is coming at a lower profit, a lower margin. Um, and so what's interesting is that the, fa that, that the company is actually planning on focusing more on Dollar Tree, the Dollar Tree banner. At that location, the fastest growing consumer segment is shoppers who are actually making over $125,000 a year. So those people are willing to shell out for those discretionary items. So this is Family Do Dollar Tree trying to kind of reconcile its footprint and focus on the shoppers who have more money right now. What about lower income shoppers and their options then at this point? So this is a huge blow to lower income shoppers. Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, they have huge presences inside of rural areas. And in those locations, they're food deserts. It's really hard to get the basic essentials. And as these companies have expanded into those areas, Smaller businesses, smaller grocers have closed because it's so hard to compete. So without the family dollar, without the Dollar Tree, this might be the only place where people could get a carton of eggs, a, you know, a jug of milk. So now they're going to be forced to potentially drive 30 miles away to the nearest Walmart, to the nearest grocer. That's more gas money, that's more drain on the income, and that's even less money for those households. Gabrielle Van Rouge, thank you very much for walking us through all that. Appreciate it. Of course. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one. The Oklahoma State Medical Examiner says a high school student, Next Benedict, died by suicide. You'll remember Next died last month after a fight at school. The report lists the probable cause of death as a combination of two drugs. The full report is set to be released later on this month. Number two, officials in Japan are telling people to stay away from a cat covered in toxic chemicals that apparently fell into a tank of liquid with some kind of a chemical inside at a factory. According to a local news outlet, an employee found a trail of yellowish brown paw prints heading away from the tank and then surveillance footage showing the cat leaving. Officials want people to let the city know if they see a cat that looks abnormal. Number three, a new study says playing with dogs helps people concentrate and relax. Research, if you have a dog, this will not be news to you, right? Researchers hooked up electrodes to folks and measured what's happening in their brains. They found when people played with four-year-old Arrow, that pup, brain waves associated with concentration and relaxation got stronger. Number four, Neil Young, he's coming back to Spotify. There he is, a couple years after pulling his music to protest COVID misinformation on Joe Rogan's show. 
He says Apple and Amazon have started serving the same disinformation in podcasts. And if he boycotts them, there wouldn't be enough places to stream his music. So he is back on the spot. Number five, Kelly Clarkson and Peyton Manning will co-host the Paris Olympics opening ceremony this summer, along with, of course, Mike Tirico, the best. It's going to be held right along the Seine River in Paris, the first, the Seine River, the first time the Summer Olympics opening ceremony will not be in a stadium. How about that? It's going to be Riverside this time. July 26th, circle it on your calendar. Should be fun. When we come back, the search for a Texas college student missing more than a week, expanding tonight. What we know about the moments before he disappeared. Plus, why a worker at a Virginia Wildlife Center is dressed up, yep, like this. We'll explain. Police say the search is expanding tonight for a Texas college student whose family says he vanished in the middle of the night after he got a food delivery. Caleb Harris has been missing since March 4th, last seen at his apartment complex not far from the Texas A&M campus where he went to school. Here's what we know. Police think he disappeared sometime around 3 a.m. on the 4th. That's based on an Uber Eats order he made just before that and then a Snapchat he sent to his little sister around 2.45. His phone was then either shut off or died. His family says he left behind his keys, his wallet, his car, even his shoes. NBC's Morgan Chesky is following this one for us from Dallas. And Morgan, what a mystery here. What do we know about the status of this search and where the optimism might be? Yeah, Hallie, the search very much ongoing here. As for the status of where he might be, that is the big question right now that investigators are trying to figure out. Hundreds of people have volunteered to join in the ongoing search for college student Caleb Harris, uh, that missing student from Texas A&M Corpus Christi. It's now been eight days, and one of the most frustrating aspects of this, Hallie, is the fact that you have hundreds of volunteers and Corpus Christi police now joining forces with the Coast Guard there's still not been a credible lead over more than a week. And as a result of that, the student's own father had this to say today. Take a listen. It's, a, it's, it's at a point where he has, he literally has just vanished and there's no leads, there's no clues. Um, that's what makes it so difficult because we have no, um, no direction more than anything. Uh, as far as a place to go, a place to look. Now, as of right now, of course, uh, the authorities are calling on the public to help with the ongoing search for Caleb Harris. In the meantime, another missing college student uh, has drawn a lot of attention from the city of Nashville, and, and that is where a, a different student by the name of uh, Riley Slane has been, uh, he's been missing since Friday, Hallie. He was visiting from the University of Missouri. Surveillance footage captured in and around a popular Nashville uh, street has seen him, uh, and that's been released today. But as of right now, he, like Caleb Harris, uh, still has uh, essentially disappeared, much to the frustration uh, of their families. Hallie? Yeah. Morgan Chesky live for us there in Dallas. Morgan, thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, police say a man holding a chainsaw is in custody after a three-hour standoff with officers in L.A. You can see him. You're about to see him in the back of a pickup truck. There he is. Police say he was visibly distressed, that he also had an arrest warrant out for a different incident outstanding. Out of our Washington Bureau, the National Park Service says it'll remove around 300 trees in the city, half about those iconic cherry blossom trees. This is part of a three-year project to fix up the crumbling seawalls right around the Tidal Basin. Officials say it's gonna happen later this spring. If you're coming into town for cherry blossom season, don't worry, you won't see it, it won't be affected for that. After the work is over, they're gonna plant more than 400 new trees. And out of our Southern Bureau, workers at a wildlife center in Virginia dressing up like big foxes. Why? They're taking care of a baby fox they rescued and they wanna make sure she doesn't get too attached to them. She was less than a day old when she was found, and the center says wearing the masks will make it more likely the fox could be reintroduced to the wild someday. Look at that. That looks like a Wes Anderson movie. We told you at the top of the show about the battle over TikTok in Congress, and regardless of whether it ends up approved or not, it is probably going to add to the overall geopolitical tension between the U.S. and China. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo supports the ban. She's in the region right now, leading a presidential trade and investment mission to the Philippines and Thailand. CNBC's Eunice Yoon caught up with the Commerce Secretary for an exclusive interview, the full interview you'll only see right here, on how the U.S. is building alliances at a tense time. 
<laughs> it's so nice to be here. Whether she's meeting state leaders, hobnobbing with CEOs, or enjoying local culture, President Biden's Commerce Secretary is in Asia to ensure America's influence here is on firm footing. So I've been focused on the Indo-Pacific since day one, and President Biden is so uh, clear that we need to have a strategic, forward-leaning economic vision for the Indo-Pacific. Secretary Gina Raimondo has shown up with U.S. businesses, eager to invest in traditional American allies, the Philippines and Thailand. Smile, everyone. Companies like Google, Microsoft, Meta, Visa, MasterCard, UPS, and United Airlines. $1 billion in investment were announced in Manila, training Filipinos on U.S. tech, AI tools, subsea cables, financial payments, EVs, and cybersecurity to work with American companies and their customers. In Bangkok, Raimondo said U.S. firms were ready to supercharge investments in fields like semiconductors, which she said were dangerously concentrated in one or two countries. So many U.S. companies are looking to diversify their supply chain, are looking for partners in the Indo-Pacific. That means decreasing American reliance on China, another Biden administration goal. A big part of these U.S. visits is China and its rising influence, though that doesn't come up much in public remarks. Even though Washington's competition with Beijing hasn't been mentioned officially, trips like Raimondo's are meant to solidify America's role in the region. We're not asking any country to choose. We're not saying to the businesses of the Philippines, choose China or us. We want to be the partner of choice. But concerns remain that Washington isn't doing enough, distracted by conflicts elsewhere, hampered by domestic politics, and lacking commitment to a U.S.-led regional economic agreement. What can you say to those who say the Biden administration isn't committed to this. What I say to them is, look at what we're doing. We are consistently and increasingly showing up in the region, making investments, deepening our ties, helping with upskilling. Uh, everything takes time, but we're here, we're acting, and we're, we're acting out on the president's strategy. President Biden's Commerce Department is talking tough on TikTok on a trade mission meant to secure supply chains with traditional allies here in Asia. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo gave her strongest support to date for a ban on the Chinese-owned app in my exclusive interview. TikTok presents serious national security risks to the people of the United States, data privacy risks, uh, significant national security risks. So you would support a ban? Uh, I would. I would. Our thanks to Eunice for that exclusive report. Coming up, a lot more to get to on the show, including an NBC News investigation about investment groups, private equity groups, buying up companies that offer autism care. Why well, that's raising questions about whether they're putting profits over patients. So we've got to get to some news just breaking into us in the last couple of minutes. A federal judge now laying out a tentative trial date for the president's son, Hunter Biden, and it happens to be right in the middle of his father's general election re-election campaign. NBC's Tom Winter is joining us now. So early June, it's looking like, Tom? That's right, Hallie. June 3rd is when this trial is slated to begin. Of course, that can always change uh, depending upon motions that are filed pre-trial, if there's anything uh, for uh, the judge to consider or reconsider, depending upon what the defense, uh, Hunter Biden's attorneys, might say. But at least at this uh, juncture, it appears that he'll be going to trial in the District of Delaware, uh, so very close to where he grew up and, of course, where the Biden family is from. Uh, anticipated to face this gun possession charge. Uh, basically, uh, while he had a gun in his possession or went to to purchase one, I should say, uh, that he lied on a federal form about whether or not he was using drugs at the time. Federal prosecutors have pointed to his statements, including statements in his own book uh, that address this. So that's really kind of the uh, the heart of these charges. Of course, we have to mention that there uh, it's a particular charge that is not brought very often. Uh, it is a charge uh, that uh, you're looking at the three counts there uh, related to those false statements on that firearm form that he's alleged to have been made. He's pleaded not guilty, of course. 
course, uh, to this. And so uh, basically this trial is kind of uh, a cut and dry. Whether or not the gun was in his possession at the time, uh, they'll presumably use statements from his own book, and then they'll presumably uh, present the form and have an agent testify to it. And you're looking at the one specific to this case. He does face uh, federal charges, Hallie, as you well know, uh, tied to uh, a case involving his income taxes and those filings. And that's going to be uh, a trial that will be held at a later date in California, so a federal court there. So that's kind of tracking the latest uh, developments in this case, uh, but it looks like uh, we'll be headed to trial in this on June 3rd. Yeah, at least that's what it's set for tentatively. Tom Winter, thank you very much. Lots yep. to follow. Appreciate it. Sure thing. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching and an NBC News investigation about a flood of insurance money for autism services heading into the pockets of private equity firms. Autism treatment is covered by private insurers and Medicaid in all 50 states. So these private equity firms, big investment groups, might see this as a business opportunity, buying up companies that offer this kind of care. I traveled down to Louisiana to meet one mom who says private equity, in her view, put their profits over the care for her son. Watch. You'd never know J.J. Bautista only started speaking at the age of five. That half. This half. These days, he's got a million questions. Put the camera sleeping. this way. Can I use it? In the Can I use it? But when he started asking his mom, Misty Richard, every day about bad weather, terrified it might storm, her intuition told her something was wrong. This got progressively worse to the point where we were at a friend's house. It started raining and he wouldn't get in the car. I had literally had to pick him up and put him in the car because he was scared to death. He was scared of the rain. He right, was scared, scared of the storms. weather. Mm -hmm. yeah. JJ's on the autism spectrum, and in 2017, his mother enrolled him at a private therapy clinic near their home in Baton Rouge. At first, happy with JJ's progress at CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. But after the chain of clinics was acquired by a prestigious private equity firm, Blackstone, in 2018, she said she became worried about some of the staffing changes she saw. They had a lot of turnover of people at the time. Her concerns coming to a head in June 2022, when JJ melted down at the clinic. After repeatedly asking for details, which Richard says the clinic only reluctantly provided, she was shown a video of her son in a therapy session and a staffer flipping the lights on and off, apparently to mimic lightning. Her son, she says, visibly upset. And so watch my child go from the screen door to the window to the screen door to the window, won't come outside on the porch, won't leave the house if it's even drizzling, it pissed me off to no end, and you basically tortured my special needs kid. This is emotional for you. It makes now. me so mad. So they framed it as a therapy lesson. Right. Do you believe it was? That's bullshit. That was not a therapy lesson. You're supposed to be like medical professionals, and you tortured my son, and you laughed about it. Blackstone, in a statement to NBC News, denied its ownership of CARD had anything to do with JJ's harrowing experience, saying the firm could not comment on a particular client, but said the firm was never involved in determining the appropriate course of treatment for patients. Blackstone also says the company significantly increased clinical training under its ownership. Two employees disputed this and provided a document showing training time cut roughly in half between 2016, two years before Blackstone's takeover, and 2020. About one in every 36 kids is diagnosed with autism in the United States. Treatment covered by Medicaid and private insurers in all 50 states. And now services to help those kids with autism have become big business, generating an estimated $7 billion a year in revenue. Private equity flooding the zone with those firms behind 85% of company buyouts between 2017 and 2022. When private equity takes over a company, it's like if the mob moved into your neighborhood. That's what it feels like, uh, that the mob has taken over uh, our profession. It hurts my heart. John Bailey runs an ethics hotline for ABA therapy, applied behavior analysis, often used to treat autism. He says he hears time and again these private equity firms are putting profits over patients. I'm worried about what's going to happen down the road as uh, the private equity erodes our value systems. Card ended up filing bankruptcy in May. Blackstone says the company's financial issues were the result of well-documented industry-wide challenges stemming from impacts of the pandemic and its aftershocks and insufficient reimbursements from insurers. It was incredibly devastating. Doreen Grandpiche founded CARD in 1990 and spent the next 25 years building it into the largest autism services provider in the country. She's the one who sold to Blackstone in 2018, but left her board seat after four years. Frustrated, she says, with management's decisions to add expensive executives and third-party contracts. 
Now she's back in charge after purchasing most of the company's operations last summer and pledging to rebuild, hiring 250 new staffers in training and opening up clinics to new patients. Helping children and families with autism is my entire life. I started working in this field when I was 16 years old and I could not walk away seeing that there's still a lot to be done. Um, I could not just retire knowing that all the amazing things that we built at CARD uh, could have disappeared or gone away. Blackstone tells NBC returning CARD to its founder was the right thing to do so she could keep its existing center-based facilities open for patients. As for JJ, now nine years old, he's receiving treatment at a new facility. His mom filed a complaint with the Louisiana Behavior Analysis Board, and in February, the card staffer involved in the light switch incident was disciplined for ignoring a client's demand to stop an action that was agitating and provoking the client. The anger for JJ's mom, still raw. So you believe that they were motivated by profit? Of course. Yes, because you're obviously not interested in helping kids. They don't care about anyone but their pocketbook. Across the healthcare industry, independent research shows patient care can decline after private equity firms buy in. At hospitals, one study found more patient falls and infections after the facilities were acquired by private equity firms. And at nursing homes owned by these kinds of places, a 10% higher mortality rate, according to other research. Still to come here on the show, what a former Nickelodeon star is saying in a new docuseries about alleged abuse by an acting coach. More on that and some other toxic environment claims coming up. Former CNN anchor Don Lemon today announcing his new talk show on X has been canceled by Elon Musk even before a single episode aired or streamed or X'd or whatever you want to call it. It was going to debut with an interview with Musk. Listen to this. Hi, everyone. Elon Musk is mad at me. And I just put out a statement about what happened between him, me, and the interview that he is apparently so upset about. Lemon posted that video, by the way, and that statement on X. He called his own questions respectful and wide-ranging, but said Musk clearly felt differently. Musk, for his part, says Lemon's interview style, I'm quoting here, lacked authenticity. Lemon interviewed him last Friday and says it's still going to air on YouTube, and yes, even on X. Brian Stelter is joining us now. What else do we know? Like, what's up with this, especially some of this reporting that there was some tension during the conversation? What does it mean for a questioner to lack authenticity? Right. I was told by a source who was in the room for the interview that it was like a bad first date, that these two men didn't gel. There was no great good vibe. But that's no reason to cancel a multimillion dollar partnership deal. You know, Elon Musk, now that he owns X, he wants to turn it into a YouTube alternative. He needs big video creators. And that's why he signed Don Lemon back in January. There was a big splashy announcement on stage saying that Lemon was going to have a show on X and other stars are also going to be on X. And now X has been out there in the marketplace selling these shows to advertisers. But apparently after the interview, Musk did not like it. He texted uh, Don Lemon's agent and said the contract is canceled. So Musk says Lemon can still put content on X. He can still put stuff on X, but the company's right. just not going to pay him for that, right? On the one hand, there's this sort of laying claim to free speech. On the other, canceling this agreement over what seems to be a disagreement on content. Here's what Lemon said. Speaking of free speech, right, I thought the first person interview, no brainer, Elon Musk, the man who calls himself a free speech absolutist. I asked him to do it. He willingly agreed to the interview. Apparently, free speech absolutism doesn't apply when it comes to questions about him from people like me. But Brian, when Elon Musk owns the site, he can platform who he wants, right? Or de-platform who he wants. That's right. That's why it's so interesting and important to interrogate these powerful people who own these platforms, whether it was Mark Zuckerberg, whether it's Elon Musk. I think in this situation, Musk is proving his critics right. They're proving that he's thin-skinned, erratic, that he's not actually as tolerant of free speech and criticism as he says. But look, we don't really know what happened in the interview yet. I suspect that Don Lemon asked Musk about reports that he'd used illegal drugs in the past. That's a very sensitive topic for Musk. After all, Musk is a government contractor. Government contractors aren't supposed to be used drugs. Mm. So we're going to see what's actually in this interview, uh, and that is going to be very telling. Uh, at the end of the day, as you said, Musk has all the power here. Musk can cancel whoever he wants, but Musk says the platform's a video first platform. He wants to be more like YouTube, and in order to become more like YouTube, he needs people to post content. In other words, he needs people like Don Lemon. Brian Stelter, glad to have you on. Thank you very much for breaking this Thanks. one down for us, and I appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now.
it is all on the line for TikTok, gearing up for a TBD vote in the Senate that would force a sale or else a ban. What we're hearing tonight from Congress and the TikTok team about a move that could affect more than 150 million users. Then former President Trump off the hook for some charges in that Georgia, ele Georgia election interference investigation. What it means for the Fulton DA's case with Mr. Trump headed to court in a different legal issue tomorrow. Then in Haiti, U.S. boots on the ground as a country in crisis crumbles into chaos. More on the Marines in Port-au-Prince with our reporter landing just across the border late tonight. We'll have that in just a sec. In Texas, police widening their search for a college student who disappeared after a late night Uber Eats order. We're gonna hear what his family wants to see now. Plus Dollar Tree saying they're gonna close thousands of stores across the country. Why a lifeline for a lot of shoppers is fading away. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we start with TikTok, yes, on the clock, with its future in the hands of the Senate. After that House vote in just the last couple hours on a bill that would ban TikTok, that would ban this super popular app, unless, unless its Chinese owner sells off TikTok in the next six months. TikTok's not happy. They're not being shy about it. They say the bill was jammed through its CEO on the Hill today, presumably to try to keep the app alive. As his company points out, TikTok's not just good for people who love trends and tutorials, it's good for the economy too, they say. Here's the thing, even some supporters of the bill say they don't wanna see the end of TikTok altogether. They just hope to strong arm the app out of, as they see it, Beijing's control. Because remember, that's what this is all about. Lawmakers who argue TikTok is a national security threat. Our intention is for TikTok to continue to operate, but not under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. I have no problem uh, with continued dance videos or even political campaigning on TikTok so long as the ownership structure changes. TikTok denies it's controlled by the Chinese government, but remember the concern here, not just that TikTok can access your data, but for what you see here, it's influence potentially on U.S. elections, that the Chinese could spy on Americans. One study saying it probably promotes content backed by the Chinese government. We just heard, in fact, from the director of national intelligence just this week, who said, she can't rule out whether China could use TikTok to try to influence the upcoming election. One of the biggest questions right now, what will the Senate do? Because remember, this is not a done deal yet. That's a major TBD with our Hill team reporting some question marks. Literally, you see them on screen, actual question marks. However, if it does pass, the White House says President Biden would sign it into law if it lands on his desk. Brian Chung is following the business angle. Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill. Um, reality check then, right? Gut check, because this bill passed the House with flying bipartisan colors, if you will, not unanimous, but you saw Democrats and Republicans backing it. Talk us through the path to potentially get to President Biden's desk if it, make it makes it that far. Yeah, Hallie, this was an overwhelming bipartisan vote, 352 votes for this bill to force TikTok to uh, divest, to uh, relinquish you know, the Chinese ownership or be banned. Uh, this vote in the House included almost every member of Democratic and Republican leadership. It included uh, lawmakers ranging from Nancy Pelosi to far-right members of the, the uh, Freedom Caucus on the right. One of the reasons they were able to get so much support is that they had a series of national security briefings from the administration talking about the various dangers here uh, of uh, the Chinese government potentially utilizing a provision in their law to get access to this uh, you know, user data on 170 million Americans. That's something that could happen. TikTok insists it won't. TikTok insists that China has not asked for this information and that it hasn't provided any, but uh, the U.S. government is not convinced that it never will, uh, which is why they're providing this ultimatum in this bill. Uh, Pelosi, who I just mentioned earlier, talked also about how this is not an outright ban. They managed to structure it in a way that won support. Take a listen to what she said. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tick, tack, toe. A winner. A winner. Now, it's not quite that simple, Hallie, because if they simply rename it to Tic-Tac-Toe, it would still be banned because the provision says a foreign adversary controlled app is still not uh, you know, allowed to operate in the United States. So this would have to relinquish uh, out of the hands of the Chinese owners. What's interesting here is when you look at polling, a majority of Americans, about six in 10, believe that TikTok is a national security concern, but those numbers change depending on the age group, right? Because there's this fine line that illustrates it between lawmakers, you know, and voters who put them into office who might love TikTok and some of these concerns that these uh, top U.S. officials are bringing up about the national security threat potentially that TikTok poses. 
Yeah, Hallie, it wouldn't surprise anyone to learn that there are political undertones to what's going on in Congress. Of course, a huge number of young voters use TikTok, and certainly it's no, it's no coincidence that some of the biggest opponents of this uh, TikTok bill that could lead to it being banned are progressives who have a close connection to young voters. There are also some concerns about President Biden's re-election. He's trying to engage young voters. That's proving to be a big challenge for him. Senator Dick Durbin, the majority leader, uh, sorry, the uh, majority whip in the Senate, said uh, it might not be great for the president's re-election if he ends up alienating a whole host of young Young voters, Ruben Gallego, a Democratic congressman who is uh, vying for the Senate in Arizona, went on TikTok to explain his no vote, argues that there's a better way to protect national security while also preserving uh, fundamental freedoms. Mike Gallagher, the Republican chair of the China subcommittee, one of the lead authors of this bill, was somewhat more dismissive of that, saying that national security is far more important than, in his view, hoarding clicks from 17-year-olds. Hallie. Saha Kapoor, thank you very much. I want to get to Brian Chung for more. We've hit the political, the national security. There's a business piece of this too, right? What are the chances that ByteDance does sell TikTok off? Could that happen? And if they did, who would own it? Yeah, well, I mean, to the defense of uh, those lawmakers who are saying this is not a ban bill, they would have six months to divest. Well, conversations that I've had with TikTok suggest that they don't feel optimistic they would be able to sell in that timeline. Now, that might just be what they're saying, because when you consider that TikTok and ByteDance have faced this before, you see that there could be a path to perhaps selling, because you have to rewind to 2020 when pre then-President Trump had tried to do the exact same thing via an executive order, which did get held up uh, through the election and then also through the legal uh, system where he was trying to force ByteDance to sell TikTok. And in that instance, there were some potential suitors in the form of, get this, Oracle and then also Walmart. Now, those deals never came to fruition, but maybe that provides a model for them to divest if this bill does get passed into law. But again, another interesting facet of this is that 180-day timeline. It's very, very often the case that these types of big deals will take a very, very long amount of time to get done. So uh, that, that clock might not be as long as it sounds like, even though six months does sound uh, like a, quite a lot of time. Being able to pull off a deal like that would, would certainly be uh, against the, the, the the, the normal course of action when yeah. it comes to mergers and acquisitions. So we'll have to see how it pans out. Of course, TikTok has said, you know, all along, it's insisted that it works to protect user information, that uh, new U.S. user data is, in fact, stored on a U.S.-based cloud system. And they are pointing to the economic benefits of TikTok, too. I mean, we've seen this with these creators showing up, basically saying, like, this is a livelihood, that they're contributing to the economy in this, like, influencer way. Yeah, yeah, and we've spoken with TikTokers who have said they uh, ha have built entire livelihoods. They they have a store mm -hmm. and they sell things mm -hmm. on TikTok. That's the only place that they can make money. So if TikTok gets shut down, they don't feel optimistic about being able to do the same thing on Instagram or YouTube because of the virality uh, that comes with TikTok. You can reach a lot more strangers on TikTok is the way they described it to me. So this would be a big deal. But again, I mean, when they talk about the economic implications, it's not like banning TikTok would lead us into a recession or anything like that. But it, there are certainly millions of users uh, that do rely on on it as a source of income. That's certainly not dramatic to say at all. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So listen, looking ahead to tomorrow, when former President Trump is set to make an in-person appearance at a hearing in his federal classified documents case, that's tomorrow. But today, he's coming off a legal win elsewhere in Georgia, with the judge dropping a few of the charges against him in the state's election interference case, tossing out three of the counts, having to do with pressure he allegedly put on state officials to interfere in the 2020 election. The judge explaining his ruling, basically saying that the DA didn't give enough detail on the allegations, which meant the defendants, including Mr. Trump, didn't have the info they needed to defend themselves at trial. Here's the thing, though. This is not like meaning that Donald Trump's out of the woods. That is not the case. He still faces 10 counts in the Georgia case and 88 total felony counts across his four criminal indictments. NBC's Blaine Alexander is following all of this for us. Talk to us about the impact of this ruling from the DA's perspective here. What's the next move? Well, I think that's a good question. You know, I spoke with a source, Hallie, who is familiar with the DA's thinking, and, and I'm told that this ruling is under review by her office, which tells me that they've not ruled anything out. I think what's important in there is a, a line or a couple of lines that the judge put, one, making it clear that the entire indictment does not go away. That's very clear. But two, leaving open the possibility for the DA to re-indict should she so choose. In fact, she could file an appeal or she could choose to go before a grand jury, re-indict and come back and 
file these charges again. So there are certainly a couple of avenues that the DA can take if she chooses. But I do think what's important to point out is, when, as I've been speaking with uh, attorneys here in Georgia, those who have been following the case very closely, they say that the meat, the heft of this indictment still sticks, and that includes the major RICO charge here. We talked about what's ahead tomorrow, too, Blaine, with, with the former president set to appear in Florida, so further south from where you are on this classified documents hearing, right in the same week that the general election, as we're about to talk about, is like officially, presumptively official, um, set to hit a fever pitch in the next few months. He's got the case in Florida. He's got the case in Georgia. He's got these other legal issues in New York facing him as well. How, what is the interplay there as far as demands on a defendant's time? You know what, it, it, as far as George is concerned, if he has his way, if the former president has his way, it won't take up much of his time. You remember that his attorney here in Georgia, Steve Sadow, has said that these charges amount to election interference. That's what he said before a judge. He reiterated that assertion today in his statement. And so he's trying to get the entire thing pushed off until after the election, um, so sometime next year. Now remember, Fonnie Willis wanted to bring this thing to trial this summer, as early as early August. But of course, when you look at the landscape over the past past two and a half months, Hallie, we've been talking about everything but the charges against Donald Trump. We've been talking, of course, about this mm. motion to dismiss the DA and what that's going to look like. That's caused a significant delay in all of this. So when you ask, when you talk about a timeline of taking this trial in the summer, combining the two factors, one of that motion to dismiss her and two, the decision today, should she choose to appeal or, or seek a reindictment, we're talking about a significant delay of this case. Hallie. Blaine Alexander, live for us there in Georgia. Lots to juggle, lots to watch. Thank you, Blaine. Tonight, tens of millions of people are under alert with severe storms targeting the Midwest. Really bad storms targeting the South, even the West Coast. This really high-impact system that's rolling across the country. Coming is what could be Colorado's biggest storm of the season. Biggest storm in three years hitting the Rockies. Look at this. Four feet of snow expected around Denver. Wind gusts up to 40 miles an hour. It means travel. Ugh, good luck. Sorry if you're thinking of a spring ski trip. It's going to be real messy for you. Southwest, United, or put in place Colorado travel alerts ahead of the storm. They're saying, hey, rebook your travel. You don't have to pay for it. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is joining us now. Talk to us about it. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you about monster snow in Colorado, yes. and it's like pushing 75 right outside the window <laughs> of our studio here. Uh, and it was 75 in Denver just a couple days ago, crazy. too. So, you know, crazy whiplash. And this is just a classic March storm in the heartland. This is very common for this time of year. It doesn't mean anyone wants to deal with it. So we've got severe storms to deal with the next two nights. And then about the next two and a half days, the snowstorm. So let's start with the severe. So we do have a severe thunderstorm watch that is up. We're waiting for the tornado watch to be issued. Probably will be in the next hour or two for areas around Kansas City. Right now, there's no tornadoes. There's no even thunderstorms in that area. We expect those storms to pop up in about an hour or two from now. So this severe thunderstorm watch for the St. Louis area out to Columbia, Missouri is until 11 o'clock this evening. We've had one really strong storm that had ping pong size ball uh, hail with it, and that's now heading off to the east here, south of St. Louis. These other storms may try to drift up towards St. Louis in the next hour or two. We'll continue to watch that. So during the overnight hours, so that we just showed you what's happening here, but the real event, the main event, should be over the Kansas City area. That's where we expect the strongest storms, likely from about 8 p.m. to midnight. And if we get tornadoes. This is the region where they would be occurring here from Kansas City to Topeka out towards Manhattan. We do not expect a tornado outbreak, maybe just a one, two, three tornadoes. But again, that's all it takes if it hits a populated area. Then tomorrow, a much larger area for severe storms. We'll have more tornadoes tomorrow. We'll also have a lot of hail and damaging winds almost from Chicago to Dallas. So a huge area. That's why 21 million people are at risk and some big hail producing storms. Now let's go to the snow side of this. The biggest headlines will come out of the front range, we call it. That's the mountains that are just towards the west of Denver. That's where we're going to see the highest total. Someone will probably get three to four feet of snow, as you mentioned. The Denver area is kind of on the edge of that. We're starting the storm a little bit warm in Denver, so it'll be a heavy, wet snow, and we're concerned with power outages, too. So right now we're thinking somewhere around a foot in Denver, Castle Rock, possibly over 20 inches of snow. And you notice the brightest colors just to the west of Denver. That's where we could see those three to four foot totals. That's where power outages could even be widespread. Right now in Denver, as we mentioned, it was 52 earlier today, still 48 degrees, Hallie. So the temperature, it's going to take a little bit, probably right around 10 p.m. this evening is yeah. when we'll start to see going from rain to snow. But uh, yeah, there's nothing like the weather in Denver. It's one of the hardest places to predict the weather in the entire country. Uh, they change like this. Man, I mean, those meteorologists there, they're uh, earning their keep. That's they for sure. Do. Bill Karens, thank you so much. Appreciate it.
So the Secretary of State in just the last couple of hours laying out three big things Haiti needs now, a more stable government, humanitarian help, and security. Listen. This has been uh, a long unfolding story. The heart of the story is the suffering of the Haitian people. And we want to see that brought to an end. That's Tony Blinken talking with Kenya's president today about the country's security mission to Haiti as the U.S. military announces they sent a new team of Marines there to help protect the embassy, the U.S. embassy in the capital. Remember, Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, it's in a state of emergency after gangs banded together to attack government institutions, airports, prisons. Four million people there, according to the World Food Program, face what they call acute food insecurity. A million Haitians are one step away from famine. Gabe Gutierrez has just landed late tonight in the neighboring country of the Dominican Republic. He's got more for us. Hey there, Hallie. We're here in the Dominican Republic where the government is already stopping desperate Haitians from coming to this country. And in Florida today, the governor announced that he's already deploying extra law enforcement and drones in anticipation of a possible migrant influx from Haiti. There are, are growing concerns that this humanitarian crisis will spill across the hemisphere. And just today, a new team of U.S. Marines went into Haiti to help beef up security at the American embassy there. The situation there is deteriorating quickly. As we've been reporting, the uh, gang leader barbecue is calling for a civil war. And the prime minister just announced uh, yesterday that he would resign as soon as a transitional government was put in place. But there are a lot of questions on when exactly that will happen. And Hallie, again, the desperate situation for uh, people inside Haiti. We just spoke today with Mitch Album. You, you know him as the best-selling author. He was actually in Haiti at the orphanage that his charity runs and he described a dramatic escape a private helicopter came and saved him and 10 other staffers in the dead of night they piled into this helicopter and he described the experience of going across the border he had been desperate for days after that mass prison break really escalated the violence in the country and the airports and the borders have all been shut down now there have been an increasing number of Haitian that are trying to get over the border into the Dominican Republic. Again, this government is not letting them. But, Hallie, this is an ongoing situation, and there's so many questions about the future of whether the U.S. will have to get more involved. Right now, the U.S. is saying that it is helping along a multinational security force led by Kenya to try and restore order in Haiti. Hallie? Our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that reporting there from the DR. So listen, we know it has felt official for a while, but now it is officially presumptively official, a round two matchup between Joe Biden and Donald Trump come November. After both of these candidates passed that magic number they needed, the delegate math, mathing for them to clinch their party's nominations, it means it's the longest general election in generations. But they're not your only options necessarily for president this fall. You could go third party. And one candidate who you might have heard from hopes that you will. Vaughn Hilliard explains. You might remember this ad from last month's Super Bowl. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. A jingle that worked six decades ago, reworked for a new era of Kennedys. Kennedy, Kennedy. This one, not as a Democrat like his uncle, but an independent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the son of the New York senator and former attorney general, now seeking his own path to the White House. But what does he believe in? Can he actually win? Neither my uncle nor my father would recognize the version of America that we have today. RFK Jr. first made his name as a climate activist and lawyer in the 80s, before pivoting this century to pushing debunked lies that vaccines cause autism. To be crystal clear, this is not true. Scientists have proven that over and over again. But it hasn't stopped the 70-year-old Kennedy, especially since the COVID pandemic, repeatedly spreading misinformation, like his book, baselessly attacking Dr. Anthony Fauci. I pressed him on COVID and vaccines at a rally in Las Vegas last month. Would you have tried to stop the FDA from approving the, the COVID vaccine? I would have said that they need to do science to show that the vaccine is actually going to avert more problems than it's, uh, that, than it's causing. But it's if you're president, you have agency uh, I would over make sure that there was good science and that any product, but I also would have allowed people to get access to therapeutics that were actually demonstrated to work. 
like ivermectin, like hydroxychloroquine. Again, doctors say ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine should not be used to treat COVID. But Kennedy could take advantage of the growing number of Americans who don't seek out vaccines to stop COVID. Just 28% of adults have gotten the latest vaccine, down from 69% when it came out in 2021, according to a new Pew poll. The question is, is there an appetite for him or any third party candidate? A new poll out today shows yes, with RFK polling in nearly 9% of the vote, more than 20% going to someone who isn't Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But can people see him on the ballot? Right now, not many will. The campaign says it has enough signatures in just four states as they try to get on the ballot in all 50. That hasn't stopped Kennedy from preparing like he will be with a vice presidential announcement set in just two weeks. Names he's floated, New York Jets quarterback and fellow anti-vaxxer Aaron Rodgers. Vaughn is joining us now. So as we're on the topic of veep stakes, Vaughn, right. because that really is the next key political moment for both former President Trump and for, I guess, RFK Jr., you're getting some new little nuggets, we can call them, on that. What is the deal? Really, Aaron Rodgers? I thought he was going to be playing for the Jets come the fall. <laughs> he says he's going to play for the Jets come opening week in September. And, of course, we'll see at training camp what kind of shape he's in after missing most of last season. But, look, he's 40 years old. And, you know, there's maybe a presidential candidate offering him the number two slot. And the Kennedy campaign told us just 24 hours ago that the top two names on his list were not only Aaron Rodgers, the the current New York Jets quarterback, but also Jesse Ventura, the former Minnesota governor and, of course, WWE wrestler. But just here in the last hour, the son of Jesse Ventura wrote back to me, quote, Governor Ventura will not comment on this particular political speculation. He has not been officially asked to join Mr. Kennedy's campaign as his vice presidential nominee, making all of this pure speculation. But just this afternoon, the Kennedy campaign, Halley, announced that they will be holding a VP announcement rally on March 26th in Oakland, California, which is just 20 minutes from where Aaron Rodgers played his college ball at Cal Berkeley. Allie. Yeah, all right. We'll see. Fun Hilliard, um, thank you very much. I know where you'll be in a couple of weeks. Really appreciate you Thanks, reporting friend. on that tonight. Thanks. So listen, some other news breaking into us in just the last half an hour or so with a federal judge saying Hunter Biden is expected to go on trial potentially just a few months from now with a tentative trial date set for early June Keep in mind, right in the middle of his father's re-election campaign. Remember, it was back in September that a special counsel appointed by the attorney general charged Hunter Biden with three felony counts, all related to Hunter Biden's allegedly lying about his drug use when he bought a gun. NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos is joining us now. So the trial date is set. It sounds like it's going to go maybe a week to two. They laid out a few days for, the, obviously, the defense, for the prosecution, for the jury deliberations, et cetera. It's just a couple of months before the Democratic convention here. Talk about what this means legally for Hunter Biden, how you see it. Yeah, I'd be surprised if this federal trial goes two weeks. I mean, the charges are really based on the FFL, the Form 4473. They don't need to introduce a ton of documents, not a ton of witnesses or, or evidence. So you could see this case, and maybe jury selection could even last longer than the actual uh, government's case in chief. But these charges, by the way, are of questionable constitutional, constitutionality now in the wake of uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin and then another decision coming out of the Fifth Circuit. It's easy to prove if someone is charged with being a felon in possession. That's not what Hunter's charged with. It's a lot harder to prove whether or not they were un an unlawful user or addict of a controlled substance uh, while owning a firearm. So these are charges that are not commonly brought for that reason. They're of questionable constitutionality. And uh, But you are in federal court, so the case will go to trial quickly. Danny Savalas, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, a brand new study saying there could be a new way to detect colon cancer. Why researchers say a blood test might be most accurate. Plus, what Olivia Rodrigo is handing out to fans at her concert in Missouri, it may surprise you. It's not a friendship bracelet. Shares of Dollar Tree tanking today, dropping something like 15% after the company said it'll close about 1,000 stores. Places that, obviously, like the name says, offer a lot of different things at pretty low prices. So why are they closing down so many of these 
of these shops. High inflation, stores not selling enough, a decrease in SNAP benefits that help give lower income families money for food. Let's bring in CNBC retail reporter Gabrielle Von Rouge for more. So you think these stores might be doing better in times like these since people may be turning to discount stores for some of the, the items that they need. Explain this. I mean, that's exactly right, Hallie. When times are tough, discount retailers like Dollar Tree tend to do really, really well. But you have to keep in mind that their target consumer is the low income consumer. And now they're two years into persistent inflation, high interest rates, dwindling savings account. So those consumers are under a tremendous amount of pressure, and that's putting a lot of pressure on Dollar Tree's business. you got to keep in mind, Dollar Tree makes their money by selling the things that people don't actually need, discretionary items, things like toys and decorations, all the things that are nice to have. So at the family dollar stores where they're planning on closing about, um, you know, a thousand over the next couple of years, they those consumers are not buying those discretionary items. They're buying food, which is coming at a lower profit a lower margin um, and so what's interesting is that the fan that, that the company is actually planning on focusing more on Dollar Tree the Dollar Tree banner at that location the fastest growing consumer segment is shoppers who are actually making over hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year so those people are willing to shell out for those discretionary items so this is family Do Dollar Tree trying to kind of reconcile its footprint and focus on the shoppers who have more money right now what about lower income shoppers and their options then at this point so this is a huge blow to lower income shoppers. Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, they have huge presences inside of rural areas. And in those locations, they're food deserts. It's really hard to get the basic essentials. And as these companies have expanded into those areas, smaller businesses, smaller grocers have closed because it's so hard to compete. So without the Family Dollar, without the Dollar Tree, this might be the only place where people could get a carton of eggs, a, you know, a jug of milk. So now they're going to be forced to potentially drive 30 miles away to the nearest Walmart, to the nearest grocer. That's more gas money, that's more drain on the income, and that's even less money for those households. Gabrielle Von Rouge, thank you very much for walking us through all that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, new research out in just the last few hours finds a blood test could help screen for colorectal cancer. It apparently detected cancer in more than 80% of people confirmed to have it. The test is meant to screen people with an average risk who do not have symptoms. It could help catch cases early when they're more easily treated. Number two, the Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott suing a woman who he says falsely accused him of sexual assault and tried extorting him. His lawyer claims she made up a story and is trying to get $100 million from Prescott in exchange for not pressing charges. Prescott's lawyer says he never sexually assaulted anyone. The woman's lawyer calling Prescott a liar and a rapist. Number three, actress Olivia Munn says she was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a double mastectomy. She says she's had four surgeries in the past 10 months. Munn says she's lucky they caught it with enough time so that she had some options and recommends people talk with their doctors about their breast cancer risk. Number four, today's Spotify is testing out music videos, like full-length MTV-esque music videos, rolling them out to people who have premium accounts in the UK, Brazil, Kenya. Spotify is trying to get to a billion users by 2030. But you know, music videos, are they going to be a tough sell? People already watch music videos on like YouTube for free. Number five, Olivia Rodrigo giving out free emergency contraceptives at a concert in St. Louis. She teamed up with local group to pass out condoms, stickers, information about abortion care in Missouri, where abortion is illegal. NBC News has reached out to Rodrigo's team for comment. When we come back, the search expanding tonight for a missing college student in Texas. What we're learning about the moments right before he disappeared. Plus, what happened when a rocket exploded seconds after liftoff in Japan? Look at that. Police say the search is expanding tonight for a Texas college student whose family says he disappeared in the middle of the night after he got a food delivery order. Caleb Harris has been missing since March 4th, last seen at his apartment complex not far from the Texas A&M campus where I went to school. Police think he disappeared sometime around 3 a.m. on the 4th based on an Uber Eats order he put in right before that and a Snapchat he sent to his younger sister around 2.45. His phone either died or was shut off right after that. His family says he left behind his keys, his wallet, his car, even his shoes. NBC's Morgan Chesky is following this for us from Dallas. Any leads here? Any clues that police can follow? 
Yeah, Hallie, I think one of the most frustrating aspects of all of this entire investigation and ongoing search is the fact that it's now been eight days and there has not been really a shred of evidence in helping track down this missing student from Texas A&M Corpus Christi. You see him there, Caleb Harris smiling. He had been going to school right there on the Texas coast now, and he goes out to get that Uber Eats order in the early morning hours of March 4th, and he even is Snapchatting with his sister at 2.45 a.m., and that's the last time anyone has heard from him. Corpus Christi police are now working in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard trying to search the area for him. We do know that one particular place they were looking uh, is right around that apartment complex there in that coastal neighborhood there. You can see some of just the hundreds of volunteers that have joined the search to find Harris. Uh, and one of the most heartbreaking facets about all of this, Hallie, is the fact that when we had a chance to hear from his own father, he said that uh, in light of some rumors that uh, Caleb might have been thinking about running away or even harming himself, uh, that he, he expressed in, there had been no troubling signs. In, in fact, he was even sharing some text messages that he had been sharing with his own son as recently as a few days ago. Go. Take a listen. They're looking forward to going fishing the next day. Uh, renewed his apartment lease. Uh, looking forward to working in Alaska this summer. All these things are, you know, somebody that's preparing to do lots of fun things and lots of things every day. And now, as that coastal community hopes for any update uh, in the search for Harris, there is another family uh, in search of another student. Riley Strain is a University of Missouri student who had gone to Nashville on a fraternity trip, Hallie, and he has not been seen since last Friday. What is different in this case, Hallie, is there is almost an abundance of evidence here coming in the form of surveillance footage where you can see this six foot five college student wandering the streets of Nashville after he'd been told to leave a bar belonging to country music mm. star Luke Bryan. Yeah. However, despite the multiple angles of strain in Nashville, uh, nobody knows where he is. Uh, police say that despite their ongoing search near a waterway in Nashville, there is no indication at this point in time uh, that strain was in the water or has ended up in that waterway. Uh, although you can imagine the fact that there's been no sign of him since then uh, is certainly just as frustrating uh, for that family as it is for the family of Caleb Harris. I mean, you hit it right there, Morgan, these two sets of families just living an absolute nightmare with no answers. So many questions, hoping for some clarity very soon. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much for being there. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here is a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Lithuania, a close ally of the late Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is accusing President Putin's henchmen of being behind a violent attack that put him in the hospital. Police say the attacker smashed one of his car windows, sprayed tear gas into his eyes, then hit him in the hammer, hit him in the head with a hammer. He responded to the incident with a video saying, we will not give up. Out of Japan, a commercial rocket exploding just seconds after liftoff today. This is Space One, trying to be the first Japanese company to put a satellite into orbit. Ugh, nope. Officials say the rocket's automated system ended the flight after it figured it wouldn't be able to finish the mission. Nobody was hurt. The cause of the self-destruction is under investigation. That's the aftermath right there. And out of France, the mayor of Paris says she's definitely taken a dip into the Seine River ahead of the Olympics this summer, probably at the end of June. If you remember, the city's been cleaning up so that people can swim in it for the Olympics. There have been some sanitation, some sewage problems. Both the president of France and the head of the 2024 Olympics have said they'll also jump in at some point. Would you? So listen, we told you at the top of the show about the battle over TikTok in Congress. And regardless of whether it ends up approved or not, it is probably going to add to the overall geopolitical tension between the U.S. and China. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo supports the ban. She's in the region right now, leading a presidential trade and investment mission to the Philippines and Thailand. CNBC's Eunice Yoon caught up with the Commerce Secretary for an exclusive interview, the full interview you'll only see right here, on how the U.S. is building alliances at a tense time. It's so nice to be here. Whether she's meeting state leaders, hobnobbing with CEOs, or enjoying local culture, President Biden's Commerce Secretary is in Asia to ensure America's influence here is on firm footing. 
So I've been focused on the Indo-Pacific since day one, and President Biden is so uh, clear that we need to have a strategic, forward-leaning economic vision for the Indo-Pacific. Secretary Gina Raimondo has shown up with U.S. businesses, eager to invest in traditional American allies, the Philippines and Thailand. Smile, everyone. Companies like Google, Microsoft, Meta, Visa, MasterCard, UPS, and United Airlines. $1 billion in investment were announced in Manila, training Filipinos on U.S. tech, AI tools, subsea cables, financial payments, EVs, and cybersecurity to work with American companies and their customers. In Bangkok, Raimondo said U.S. firms were ready to supercharge investments in fields like semiconductors, which she said were dangerously concentrated in one or two countries. So many U.S. companies are looking to diversify their supply chain, are looking for partners in the Indo-Pacific. That means decreasing American reliance on China, another Biden administration goal. A big part of these U.S. visits is China and its rising influence, though that doesn't come up much in public remarks. Even though Washington's competition with Beijing hasn't been mentioned officially, trips like Raimondo's are meant to solidify America's role in the region. We're not asking any country to choose. We're not saying to the businesses of the Philippines, choose China or us. We want to be the partner of choice. But concerns remain that Washington isn't doing enough, distracted by conflicts elsewhere, hampered by domestic politics, and lacking commitment to a U.S.-led regional economic agreement. What can you say to those who say the Biden administration isn't committed to this. What I say to them is, look at what we're doing. We are consistently and increasingly showing up in the region, making investments, deepening our ties, helping with upskilling. Uh, everything takes time, but we're here, we're acting, and we're, we're acting out on the president's strategy. President Biden's Commerce Department is talking tough on TikTok on a trade mission meant to secure supply chains with traditional allies here in Asia. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo gave her strongest support to date for a ban on the Chinese-owned app in my exclusive interview. TikTok presents serious national security risks to the people of the United States, data privacy risks, uh, significant national security risks. So you would support a ban? Uh, I would. I would. Our thanks to Eunice for that exclusive report. Coming up, a lot more to get to on the show, including an NBC News investigation about investment groups, private equity groups, buying up companies that offer autism care. Why well, that's raising questions about whether they're putting profits over patients. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching and an NBC News investigation about a flood of insurance money for autism services heading into the pockets of private equity firms. Autism treatment is covered by private insurers and Medicaid in all 50 states. So these private equity firms, big investment groups, might see this as a business opportunity, buying up companies that offer this kind of care. I traveled down to Louisiana to meet one mom who says private equity, in her view, put their profits over the care for her son. Watch. You'd never know J.J. Bautista only started speaking at the age of five. That half. This half. These days, he's got a million questions. A Put the camera sleeping. this way. Can I use it? In the Can I use it? But when he started asking his mom, Misty Richard, every day about bad weather, terrified it might storm, her intuition told her something was wrong. This got progressively worse to the point where we were at a friend's house and it started raining and he wouldn't get in the car. I literally had to pick him up and put him in the car because he was scared to death. He was scared of the rain. He right, was scared, scared of the weather. Mm -hmm. yeah. JJ is on the autism spectrum, and in 2017, his mother enrolled him at a private therapy clinic near their home in Baton Rouge. At first, happy with JJ's progress at CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. But after the chain of clinics was acquired by a prestigious private equity firm, Blackstone, in 2018, she said she became worried about some of the staffing changes she saw. Right. They had a lot of turnover of people at the time. Her concerns coming to a head in June 2022 when J.J. melted down at the clinic after repeatedly asking for details, which Richard says the clinic only reluctantly provided. She was shown a video of her son in a therapy session and a staffer flipping the lights on and off, apparently to mimic lightning. Her son, she says, visibly upset. And so watch my child go from 
the screen door to the window to the screen door to the window, won't come outside on the porch, won't leave the house if it's even drizzling. It pissed me off to no end. And you basically tortured my special needs kid. This is emotional for you. It makes me so mad. So they framed it as a therapy lesson. Right. Do you believe it was? That's bullshit. That was not a therapy lesson. You're supposed to be like medical professionals and you tortured my son and you laughed about it. Blackstone, in a statement to NBC News, denied its ownership of CARD had anything to do with JJ's harrowing experience, saying the firm could not comment on a particular client, but said the firm was never involved in determining the appropriate course of treatment for patients. Blackstone also says the company significantly increased clinical training under its ownership. Two employees disputed this and provided a document showing training time cut roughly in half between 2016, two years before Blackstone's takeover, and 2020. About one in every 36 kids is diagnosed with autism in the United States. Treatment covered by Medicaid and private insurers in all 50 states. And now services to help those kids with autism have become big business, generating an estimated $7 billion a year in revenue. Private equity flooding the zone with those firms behind 85% of company buyouts between 2017 and 2022. When private equity takes over a company, it's like if the mob moved into your neighborhood. That's what it feels like, uh, that the mob has taken over uh, our profession. It hurts my heart. John Bailey runs an ethics hotline for ABA therapy, applied behavior analysis, often used to treat autism. He says he hears time and again these private equity firms are putting profits over patients. I'm worried about what's going to happen down the road as uh, the private equity erodes our value systems. Card ended up filing bankruptcy in May. Blackstone says the company's financial issues were the result of well-documented industry-wide challenges stemming from impacts of the pandemic and its aftershocks and insufficient reimbursements from insurers. It was incredibly devastating. Doreen Grandpiche founded CARD in 1990 and spent the next 25 years building it into the largest autism services provider in the country. She's the one who sold to Blackstone in 2018, but left her board seat after four years. Frustrated, she says, with management's decisions to add expensive executives and third-party contracts. Now she's back in charge after purchasing most of the company's operations last summer and pledging to rebuild, hiring 250 new staffers in training and opening up clinics to new patients. Helping children and families with autism is my entire life. I started working in this field when I was 16 years old and I could not walk away seeing that there's still a lot to be done. Um, I could not just retire knowing that all the amazing things that we built at card uh, could have disappeared or gone away. Blackstone tells NBC returning card to its founder was the right thing to do so she could keep its existing center-based facilities open for patients. As for JJ, now nine years old, he's receiving treatment at a new facility. His mom filed a complaint with the Louisiana Behavior Analysis Board, and in February, the card staffer involved in the light switch incident was disciplined for ignoring a client's demand to stop an action that was agitating and provoking the client. The anger for JJ's mom, still raw. So you believe that they were motivated by profit? Of course. Yes, because you're obviously not interested in helping kids. They don't care about anyone but their pocketbook. Across the healthcare industry, independent research shows patient care can decline after private equity firms buy in. At hospitals, one study found more patient falls and infections after the facilities were acquired by private equity firms. And at nursing homes owned by these kinds of places, a 10% higher mortality rate, according to other research. Still to come here on the show, what a former Nickelodeon star is saying in a new docuseries about alleged abuse by an acting coach. More on that and some other toxic environment claims coming up. Former CNN anchor Don Lemon today announcing his new talk show on X has been canceled by Elon Musk even before a single episode aired or streamed or X'd or whatever you want to call it. He's going to debut with an interview with Musk. Listen to this. Hi, everyone. Elon Musk is mad at me. And I just put out a statement about what happened between him, me, and the interview that he is apparently so upset about. Let me post that video, by the way. And the Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.